There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. One more time. There is power in the name of Jesus. Here, to what? To break every chain. Break every chain. Break every chain. All right, that's your first one. Second one. Turn your eyes upon Look full at his wonderful face. And what will happen? And the grow strangely dim. All right, some of y'all know it. That's what we're going to be talking about today. We're finishing out this series on communion, and I'm going to share with you today about how there is power in the taking of communion. In the first week, we talked about purpose. Last week, Pastor Austin talked about the importance of not taking it lightly in communion, and today, the power that is in this bread and this juice and what happens when we take holy communion together like a seed that is planted in soil good soil we put these elements into our mouths but let me ask you a question do you put these elements into your body when you come into a worship service do you do it without much thought do you do it as routine or do you truly understand the power that can take place in Holy Communion when you take it with hope and expectation? And it's not a secret when I talk about hope and expectation because we just sang it in that song. What Holy Communion is, is a turning of your eyes upon Jesus, looking full at his wonderful face. And what happens in the power of this communion is the things of earth grow strangely dim. And so this morning, we're going to look at this and look specifically at what Jesus talked about when it comes to who he is and how we can take that into our time of holy communion together. So I'm going to lead you in communion as we get to the end of this message. And if you want to get those elements, you can while we go here. But first, there's going to be several verses that I'm going to go through today. Uh, John 6, verse 35 is one I'm going to start with. This is Jesus talking about who he is. In 635, he says this, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. There are two very important life-giving things that Jesus mentions here as to who he is. He is the bread of life of life. And he says, when you take of me, you will never hunger. He will say in John 4 that he is the living water. So you will never thirst. He's pointing out here, whoever comes to me and shall not hunger, you shall not thirst. He's talking here spiritually of what takes place when we are fed with him. When we sit at his table, we will always have enough to eat. We will always have enough to drink. And he gives us a seat at his table when we call upon his name. We believe in him. We follow him. He says, come have a seat. And he takes it one step further. Have communion with me. The very definition of communion, if you were just to go look it up in your dictionary, it's to share and exchange intimate thoughts and feelings that reach into the depths of of your soul. That's what communion is on a purely physical level. Communion with someone is where you are real. It's authentic. In your soul is where you need peace. You can fake peace on the exterior, right? But you know what's going on inside of you. You ever talk to someone who did public speaking and you said, you look pretty good. And that person says, inside, I was dying. We don't know what's going on on the inside of someone. True communion is when what's inside of us is what's being revealed. It's coming out. Because inside is where you need peace. Inside is where you need comfort. Inside is where you need healing. And that often makes its way to what then happens outside. 
And Jesus, in his grace, his goodness, and his mercy, says to you through Holy Communion, let's be real. Tell me who you are. What's going on? What happened today? What's going on this week? What's going on in your life? Now, he knows all those things. But there's something different that takes place when you bring it to the altar, when you bring it to him in this time of Holy Communion, this one-on-one that takes place in this intimacy that you have with Jesus Christ. Take these elements in remembrance of me. When you turn your eyes upon Jesus and you look full at his wonderful face, the reason the things of earth grow strangely dim is because it brings back into focus what Christ has done for you. The victory that Christ won for those who believe and call on his name. That is where the peace happens. That is where the forgiveness takes place. That is where there's healing spiritually and physically at his table. If I were to hold a seed in my hand, let's go ahead and just use this. If I were to hold a seed in my hand, let's say, for example, that this seed was uh, an acorn. Would it do anything if I just held it in my hand for the rest of eternity? It would just always be an acorn. But what happens when I take that and I plant it? What happens when it gets watered? You see, a lot of times we'll say things like this. Well, it's so hard to have faith. Is it? Is it really? Because if I were to take this acorn and plant it, and it was watered, would you even give it a second thought? You would just be looking for the tree. When will the tree come out? But a lot of times we treat the seed that's in our hand, and we go, well, I'll never plant it. Or maybe we just take it and don't have expectation. We don't have hope, whatever it may be. But when we gather every single Sunday and we take Holy Communion and we hold this up and we say, this is the bread of life. It represents the body of Jesus Christ who went to the cross, his body torn for our sins. And we take it. What faith do you have when you are taking it? Is it just like anything else that you put into your mouth? Is it just like anything that you you don't give much credence to? Or do you recognize that Jesus said, I am the bread of life, that when you take it and you are having a seat at his table, that life is entering your body, his life, eternal. And the power that takes place when you do that, like a seed planted, and that when you take the cup that represents his blood, Pour it out for you for the washing away of sins that it is the watering of that beautiful seed. What is going on inside of you? It doesn't take much faith. How many of you have called upon Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you step back and you go, I am saved by grace, not by works so that no one can boast and there is no doubt in my mind. It doesn't take much faith for that. You walk in that salvation. So when you walk in that salvation and you come and you take this holy communion together, let me ask you the question, what did you bring with you to that table? Is there a need to repent and just to fall on your knees before Jesus and just say, Lord Jesus, forgive me? Is there a need, is there a healing that might be taken? It could even be in your physical body where you go to Jesus and say, Lord Jesus, I need healing. Give me that touch, just like you touched the blind man, just like you touched the woman with the issue of blood who reached out to you, who looked to you and she was healed, just like the many in Scripture who found healing in you, Jesus. Every time I take communion and this elements of life go into my body, I know, Lord, you can heal. In Luke 22, verse 19 and 20 is one of the accounts of the Lord's Supper. And in verse 19, it says, And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them, the disciples, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. And we talked about in week one where Passover started with Moses and the angel of death that creeped over and the, the angel would pass over when they put the blood of the lamb on the doorposts. And now how Jesus was saying, now here's the new covenant. I am the new lamb. The new lamb who will be sacrificed. So whoever in remembrance of me does these things will be saved. Will be, death will pass over. And Jesus here says, this is my body given for you, holding the bread of life. And that's what you hold in your hands each time you take. In Isaiah 53, 5, you can stay in Luke 22, but I'll, I'll show you Isaiah 53, 5 on the screen. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. Another way to read that would be this. Take your transgressions, he took them. Your iniquities, he took them. The chastisement that sends you to stress and anxiety and worry and no peace, he took that so you would be brought peace. And with his wounds, you are healed. Are all of these things going through your mind and your heart each Sunday when we take communion together. You see, in our personal relationship with Jesus Christ, when we walk into a sanctuary, when we walk into a time of worship, it is very much a role of the pastor and the worship team to kind of usher you into that presence. But let me just put, put it back on each of us who are sitting in the pews for a moment. It's your relationship with Jesus Christ. My relationship with Christ is not yours. What are you doing to prepare your heart, to prepare your mind, to prepare all these things when you are entering into a house of worship, listening or singing songs, listening to a message or reading scripture, taking holy communion? What are the, pre the preparation things that you are doing to get yourself to that place that everything I just said makes you realize I'm holding the bread of life? And the, the ailment that is facing me right now, there is power in the name of Jesus. That I'm going to turn my eyes to him as I take this into my body. For the cup of the blood that was poured out for my sins, Lord Jesus, what? Forgive me of those sins. The ones that I know of, the ones that I don't know of, Lord, I want to be made clean before you. Create in me a clean heart, oh God. Be prepared as you take these elements his body bruised, punched in the face by Roman soldiers. His body whipped, stripes across his back for your healing. Crown of thorns across his head, nailed in his hands and his feet, pierced with a spear in his side for our transgressions, for our iniquities. It was our chastisement upon him. So our first thought when we sit down at the table, his table for communion, should be overwhelming gratitude and thankfulness. You know, a lot of times when we're, we're facing trials and troubles, whether, it, whether it's a physical uh, healing that we need or something emotional, whatever it may be, when you go to Jesus with a full heart of gratitude and thankfulness, you will notice how your day changes. You will notice a heart that starts to fill with joy. This is why Paul talks about repeatedly in Scripture, I consider all things joy. I consider it pure joy when I face trials and tribulations, whatever it may be, because he knows who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for him. And that's our first thought when we sit at the Lord's table. Overwhelming thankfulness and gratitude. Because when we start in that place, we will notice that our, our hearts and mind begin to shift. Maybe if I took it one step further, a shift in understanding that what we are truly holding in this remembrance cup is a holy medicine a holy medicine that we take. 
that Jesus gave to us and for us for forgiveness and for cleansing, for peace and for strength and for healing. In other words, the bread of life being taken into your body and the cup representing the blood taken into your body, you can receive it with a blessed assurance. Jesus is yours. And that's where that things of earth grow strangely dim. When you take these elements, take them in faith. Faith that you have drawn closer to Jesus, knowing that your Lord and Savior has an intimate relationship, intimate relationship with you that is on a deeper level than it was before. It should be special. Because that's what the Lord's Supper is. A meal that draws you closer to him at his table. When you are at the Lord's table, he wants you to be honest about who you are, honest about where you are. And remember, that's what communion is. And think about this, whenever we have a meal, right? Or you invite someone over to your home and, and you're having a meal at your table. There is a deeper relationship there. There is a, an intimacy that is taking place there. You just don't invite anyone you bring people into your home that you want to know on a deeper level, to form relationships with, whatever it may be. Think about that when you think of the God of the universe who created all things, who went to the cross for you to take on the sins of the world, then says to you, take these elements in remembrance of me, sit at my table. If you were invited to a dinner of the world leaders, and they said, here, come sit at the table. Would you show up in t-shirt and shorts? No. Would you show up ungrateful? No. Would you show up putting forth your best foot and saying, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do everything I can to show them how much I appreciate it. This is what we have when we take the Lord's table together. And when we do these things, it, it should open our eyes to a whole new power, a whole new relationship with Christ that maybe we didn't have before. So I'm going to share a, a familiar story from Scripture to, to illustrate this just a little bit. So turn with me to Luke 24. This is a story that takes place after the resurrection of Jesus, of two strangers on the road to Emmaus. Again, I said it's a familiar story. We're going to start in verse 13. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he, he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? And he said to them, Jesus responded, what things? Let's stop here for a moment. A familiar story, but... Let's look at the details. We have two travelers here walking, talking with each other about the events of the past three days. The arrests, the trials, the crucifixion, the burial. But in all of this, as they're going through this conversation, Jesus appears to them. And they don't recognize him because it says their eyes were closed, so they couldn't recognize who he was. If I could just take this one step further, here's the deal. If you're not looking for Jesus, you're not going to see him. They're not looking for Jesus because in their eyes and in their mind, why would they be? And this is fascinating because of what we're going to read here in just a few moments. But the words I want you to look at is this. In this story that they're sharing as they're talking and they're walking, did you see where it said, they stood still looking sad? How many times do you walk into a church service? How many times do you walk into your Bible study? How many times do you spend time in your relationship with the Lord in your one-on-one -on -one time and you're sad? Let me ask you a question. Why? Why are you sad? Do you understand what you have in Jesus? 
Do you understand who Jesus is? Do you understand that he calls you his child? Why are you sad? They stood there looking sad. They were in the pit. I'm not saying we don't get in the pit, right? Listen, I was in the pit on Monday. I was in the pit. I was in a perfect position to birdie a par five. And I was going to use a club. I was going to lay up and it was going to be safe and just get my birdie and I was going to be done. But then there was another guy who I got paired with named Gene. I don't like Gene. Gene talked me out of laying up and he talked me into going for it. You could get eagle, Josh. Gene. I listened to Gene. I double bogeyed that hole. I was in the pit. Let's get back to the word. Okay. No, we get in the pit for real. That, that's just a joke. But listen, there are times, right, when you, you ever get there and you just, there's nothing you can do. You feel like you can't pull yourself out of it. And, and you're, you're down, whatever it may be. It could be news that you have just heard. It could be a situation that you are walking through that you think to yourself, again, seriously, am I living Murphy's Law? Because everything goes wrong all the time. And you find yourself in these places. And, and listen, here's two people who are clearly followers. And when they're talking about the events that have taken place over the past three days, yeah, they're in a pit. And you're about to find out why they're in a pit. But for those who ask questions like this, and this is important, when you're in a pit or you just have doubts or you, you want to be praying for something and someone says, that's not that important. Jesus doesn't care about that. You don't need to pray for that. Jesus knows. God knows. This is a story right here where Jesus knows everything that has been going on. Everything. And yet, in this intimate conversation, he says to them, what things? Does Jesus know what's going on? 100%. But he still wants to hear from them. Tell me, what's going on? What's happening inside of you? Why are you down? Why do you feel the way you feel? Share it. Tell me, what things? So you see, Scripture is clear to us. Philippians 4, 6 tells us, don't be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and supplication, make your requests known to God. Bring it to God. Bring it to Him in remembrance of Him. What things ail you? What things have you down? What things do you need to bring to Jesus, make your requests known to him. So Jesus asks this question to these two travelers. And look how they respond. Verse 19, this is the second part of verse 19. They said to him, it's concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Hold on a second. Did you catch this? Because I had to reread it many times. And I've heard this story so many times. Y'all put this together for me. Help out your pastor. Let's put these pieces together. They were walking, having a conversation, looking at the events of the last three days. Very easy to be down because, man, listen, he got turned over to the authorities. They beat him. They crucified him. They put him in the tomb. All this happened. And now they said, now we got women telling us the tomb is empty. And angels have appeared to them and said, he is risen. What? You're sad. You're looking sad. Can you all connect the dots for me? It's like your team wins the championship and you're like, oh, I feel bad for the other team. <laughs> they heard the good news. 
that he's risen. But remember it said their eyes were blinded. They couldn't see. They couldn't recognize him. There are moments in life when we're in the pit, when, when things aren't going well, and you got to step back for a moment. This is where you need to have people in your life who will point you to Scripture, not to some other weird, mystic, strange thing, but to Scripture to remind you of who you have in Jesus Christ. So that when you're in the pit, and when you're down, and when your eyes are blinded because you can't even see truth in front of your eyes, that someone will come along and say, rise up, because he is risen. And you have him. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full at his wonderful face. You don't need to walk around looking sad. You don't need to walk around in the hardness of life and the struggles of every day, especially when it seems like bad things happen all at once. What can you do? Take your holy medicine and turn your eyes upon Jesus. So you see, I mentioned this in week one. A lot of times we often look at this Holy Communion time as just something we do on a Sunday morning. When in reality, Scripture doesn't tell you anywhere how much or how little. In fact, you can every day spend intimate time in relationship with Jesus in Holy Communion one-on-one. -on -one. And take that bread of life. Take that cup that seed that goes into your body and water it in the way that only Jesus can. And so how does Jesus respond to this whole conversation of what they've just shared with him? It sounds kind of harsh at first, but I actually think it's very tenderhearted and merciful because here's what he said in verse 25, if you continue on. And he says to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. And he explains it. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, go back to the beginning. We'll pause right there. Go back to the beginning of their story. These two are walking on the road to Emmaus. They've had a seven-mile journey. There's plenty of time to talk. And so when they're sharing this and they're just laying out how they feel... This intimate conversation that's taking place, it says here that Jesus goes back and beginning with Moses and the prophets, he interprets to them why this all happened. So go back to the beginning of this series when I talked about Passover. I think Jesus went back to that time. Let me explain. So remember the story in Moses when he's bringing them out of Egypt and the 10th plague comes along and the 10th plague is the angel of death who comes into the camp. But if the Jews sacrifice the lamb, and they put the blood over the doorposts. And the angel will pass over them. I believe he went and told the strangers that story. Remember that story? But I also think maybe he went into Numbers 11. In Numbers 11, he, he, he tells them of God feeding the people with manna from heaven, bread of life that literally falls from heaven and feeds them when they are in the wilderness. There's a story in Numbers 21 when they're thirsty and Moses strikes the rock and water literally flows from the rock. Bread of life that feeds them manna from heaven. Water that comes from a rock. Jesus said, you will never hunger, you will never thirst. I bet you he's going through these stories. And then he says to them, with that in your mind, the bread of life and with the water that is flowing, he goes into this other story in Numbers 21, verses 4 through 9. Because of the Jews who are in the wilderness and they're wandering, you know why they had to wander for 40 years? It's because they kept grumbling and complaining and sinning against God. Was this God's fault? No. Every time God would do something for them, it just wasn't enough, or they would get tired of it, or whatever it may be, and they would lose focus and they would complain and they would say, it's better that we just never left Egypt. And so they wander in the wilderness because they just keep sinning and they keep complaining. And finally, it gets to a point in Numbers 21 where enough is enough. And in verse 4, it says this, the people spoke against God and against Moses. Now, don't 
take that lightly. Because what happens next seems very harsh, but when, when you realize that for years and years they had been wandering in the wilderness, you know their feet never swell, swelled up? You know they didn't get tired in that sense like we would? God sustained them and God took care of them, but they still go against God and against Moses. And here's what they said. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water. Hold on. What? What, what is there? Manna from heaven, water from a rock. But they're saying there is no food and there is no water. Anyone who has ever taken a young child on vacation knows when they say, I'm so bored. We haven't done anything. And you just feel that holy mercy come over you as a parent, right? Right? Am I the only one? Okay. But there's no food, there's no water, and they say this. The food and water they just said is non-existent. Then they say the truth. And we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people. <laughs> so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses, and they said, and they admit, we have sinned. We have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Now, when you made this bronze serpent, and it would have this fiery red glow to it, and it would be put upon a pole. Many people ask this question, why the serpent? Why any of these things? There's no connection to the Garden of Eden or any of that stuff here. But there is a connection to the fact that the very thing that was killing them had to be put on the pole and raised up. And when they looked to that, in other words, it was their sin that brought the serpents. The serpent was put on the pole, the pole was raised up, you look to that. He became sin who knew no sin so that we might become. Why was Jesus put on the pole? He became sin, lifted up so that anyone who would look to him would be saved. I wonder if Jesus told him that story on the road to Emmaus. He doesn't tell us that, but he went through all of these stories. In John 13, John 3, verse 13 and 14, it says, Jesus, no one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of God be lifted up. Jesus said in John 8, 28, that, is, that when he is lifted up, you will know, he says, I am he. These are the things I think about with these two travelers on the road. And remember, before Jesus began speaking, they were sad. But now... They are lifted up. So if you're still in Luke 24, and we continue on with verse 28. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted, meaning Jesus acted, as if he was going further, just going to keep walking. But they urged him strongly, and they said, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now spent. So he went to stay with them. And they're going to have a meal. Pay close attention to this next verse. Does it sound familiar? When he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and he gave it to them. Just for a moment, think about this amazing picture. These two travelers on the road to Emmaus. On Jesus' resurrection day, they're having communion with Jesus. How cool is that. And look at how familiar this language is on that last verse in verse 30. Because if I were to go to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, let me give you these three verses. Matthew 26, 26. As they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it and broke it and gave it to the disciples. Mark 14, 22. And as they were eating, he took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them. Luke twenty two nineteen, 19. And he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them. 
That's what those two travelers in Emmaus got. When he was at the table with them, he took bread and blessed and broke it and he gave it to them. It was this powerful moment that opened their eyes. If you're still in Luke 24 with me, just look at the next verse. It was this moment when he broke the bread and gave it to them that it opened their eyes. Now, we're not told that Cleopas and the other traveler, who probably was his wife, we don't know. We're not told that they were at the Last Supper, but it was this moment that familiarized them with this intimate relationship and that it was Jesus. And in verse 31, it says this, and their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight And they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? Hold your place right there. Leave that on the screen. We're going to go to verse 33 in a second. Remember, they were looking sad. Remember, Jesus begins talking. Remember, they get lifted up. Now they have completely changed where they are. He said, it felt like something inside of us was going on. Our hearts burned with every word that he shared when he told us about Moses. And he told us about the story of Passover. And he told us about being raised up. And he told us who he is and that these things must happen. And then when he broke the bread and he disappeared in front of them. Now, how many of you go, Jesus, why did you disappear? I wanted more. I wanted more. Because that's what they needed. They needed that moment. Because the results of what they did next show that that's what they needed. Verse 33, and they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. How many of y'all think they ran? Think about that. And they found the 11, the other disciples who were gathered together. And they said to them, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them. Y'all, hold up a second. Are you note takers? Do you highlight your Bible? Do you underline things in your Bible? Because this last line is one of those highlighting moments. You want to know what the power of communion is? When we take elements in remembrance of Jesus, the bread of life into our body and his blood poured out, for the forgiveness of sins, and we do this on a Sunday morning, you want to know what it does? Look at that last line. He was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Do you know the difference of what it is to know about Jesus and to know Jesus on an intimate level? Holy Communion. Because through all the talking and all the walking, it was the meal, it was the breaking of bread that opened their eyes. It was the breaking of bread that made them go, we knew something was different. I knew something was up. But when he broke that bread, it connected all of the dots. Let me ask you a question. Do you need your eyes opened to this fact? Do you need your eyes opened to the fact that you have an intimate relationship with Jesus that could go so much deeper? And he sits next to you and he says, what things? Tell me. Talk to me. Because once you start talking to me, then I, I'll talk back. And I can hold up the mirror. And I can guide you and walk with you and and send my Holy Spirit to give you wisdom and power and strength over all of these things you may be facing in this moment that you have decided in your mind you're going to face alone. When you turn to me, that's where the authority is. When you break the bread and you take the cup, that is the power of Holy Communion. Because he is God, and you have a seat at his table. It's the bread of life. It's the blood of Christ. Like a seed being planted and watering it. You walk in that faith every day. 
every day. Let me encourage you when Monday comes and whatever it is happens, designate a time to have Holy Communion with God. Take all these things that I've shared with you. And when you know what it is, I don't know what it is, but you know what it is and Jesus knows what it is. I could say things like this. If, it, if it's a matter of going, Lord Jesus, I repent. I am forgiven. And you walk away from it. In sickness, by your stripes I am healed. In despair, you were lifted up, Jesus. In your power, I am lifted up. In weakness, I am given strength, strength to move. Through your death, Jesus, I am given life. That is the power of communion. So let me encourage you each day to designate that time. I want to turn to one more scripture. I want to invite the worship team to come forward. Go to Hebrews chapter 12 with me. If you don't have a Bible and you want to turn, I'm not putting it on the screen, so there's Bibles in the pews. If you want to grab a Bible out of the pew, Hebrews chapter 12. Let this be the cement that takes what I've just shared with you and just holds it in place. And for those of you who know scripture, Hebrews 11 is talking, it's the, it's the hall of faith, the heroes of faith, and all of the different things that they went through and how God worked through them. And we get to Hebrews chapter 12, and we have a word that it begins with, therefore. And what I've just shared with you, now that you have heard it, now that you've heard the power, therefore, Hebrews 12 becomes real to you. Verse 1, therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, which is those heroes of the faith, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Pause. Don't look sad. Don't be sad. If you find yourself in the pit, don't let yourself stay there. Turn your eyes upon Jesus because when you do in verse 2, it says this, looking to who? Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated, where is he seated? At the right hand of God. That's a pretty powerful therefore. And that's what it's there for. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior and you are sitting here today and you have let some other influence persuade you, you you've let doubt, whatever it may be, let me just go ahead and tell you this right now. Uh, the truth of Jesus is held right here in the scripture. If you don't currently believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, let me go ahead and just say this as plainly as I can. You need to right now call on his name Lord Jesus have mercy on me forgive me of my sins and cleanse me of all unrighteousness I give my heart wholly to you Jesus if you find yourself in a pit right now you find yourself living in a situation where it is you feel far away and distant, let this time of communion bring you back and open your eyes. So would you stand with me this morning? I'm gonna lead us in this prayer. We'll take these elements together and then we will go to the throne of grace together in gratitude. Lord Jesus, we come to you right now and we thank you for this bread of life your body, whipped, torn, beaten, pierced for our sins. 
and then the washing of your blood, Lord, which washes away those sins. We turn away from them. We turn our eyes to you completely. And we thank you, Jesus, for your body and your blood. In your name we pray, amen.